Good afternoon. Wide World of Sports is in the Little Republic of San Marcos, where we're going to bring you a live, on-the-spot assassination. They're going to kill the president of this lovely Latin American country and replace him with a military dictatorship. And everybody is about as excited and tense as can be. The weather on this Sunday afternoon is perfect, and if you've just joined us, we've seen a series of colorful riots that started with the traditional bombing of the American embassy. All around, there are colorful flags and hats. And now the moment we've been waiting for is here. Everyone is getting quiet. The president is going to leave his office and walk down the steps of the palace. For that, we're going down on the playing area. Take it away, Howard. This is tremendous, Don, just tremendous. The atmosphere heavy, uncertain, overtones of ugliness. A reminder, in a way, of how it was in March of 1964 at Miami Beach when Clay met Liston for the first time and nobody was certain how it would turn out. The crowd is tense. And I think I see the door beginning to open. El Presidente may be coming out. It's El Presidente. It's all over for El Presidente. This reporter is going to get to him, if he can, through this mob for one last word before he expires. Here we are. Here we are. Sir, sir, you've been shot. When did you know it was all over? Fascist dictator. Well, of course you're upset, and that's understandable under the circumstances. I guess now you'll have to announce your retirement. Well, good luck to you, sir. Good luck to you. And now, if you folks will bear with me for a moment, I'm going to try and get in a word with the new dictator of San Marcos. That's assuming I can get through this noisy and demonstrative crowd. I wonder if you people would let me through. I see the general off in the distance, the new dictator talking to one of his men. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. General. General. Congratulations, General Emilio Molina Vargas. And General, a word from you, if you will, sir, for our viewers. For many years, I have waited for this day, but now I am the state. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, you've heard it with your own eyes. Now we're going to have to see what the future brings. Right now, from the little dictatorship of San Marcos in Latin America, let's go back to Jim McLean in our studios in New York. Hi, and welcome to Ward 13 Goes to the Movies. My, as I told my sister today, we're doing the movies, and she said again. And she said, is Eric Pilcher a regular now on your show? Are you, Eric? I mean, I would be honored to be a regular on Ward 13, certainly. Well, we're not uh, always Ward 13. We just started okay, lately. And we have okay. uh, Miriam uh, Banish. I got your name right. Yeah, it, it, you know, uh, you can look at the camera. Uh, because when you're looking like, you know, when you're looking like this, it looks, uh, you know. It looks bizarre. Right. right. It should be uh, our, our great Brendan wanted to make a nice desk that made everybody look great. But, you know, there's a lot of personalities that have public access TV show folks. And uh, if we cut Joe Kelly Lavasser and Will Infantine out and Bob Backus, you know, we, we don't have a, uh, a decent paycheck am amongst us. Yeah. Well, uh, let's just get to the uh, small talk first, um, Miriam. Uh, how are you preparing for Thanksgiving? Uh, not doing very much. We bought some turkey. I bought some turkey breasts because we're not going to have enough people for us to have a whole turkey. So turkey and baking pies. Do you like the taste of turkey? I do. I had a friend who was Italian. He was only half Italian. Then he was a quarter Armenian, part German, part Hungarian. So it doesn't all add up. But let's just say he was half Italian. And, you know, he, he always said turkey had no flavor, which, you know, I'm basically your Anglo-Celtic person. My mother, who was of Irish descent, when we had spaghetti, it was with Campbell's tomato soup. So you know, you know. So to me, a turkey is just a delicious. I am not a foodie. 
I love turkey. I'm not really a foodie either. Turkey has that great habit too of just knocking you out after you eat a lot. Tryptophan. What? Yeah, you're probably going to have a. Uh, uh, you're going to. You, I, I know, Eric. You're in Iowa. What you do is you have the 55-gallon drum from the refinery filled with, you know, cast off oil from every fast food joint on the Golden Mile <laughs> in Iowa City, wherever you are, and you stuff a duck that you shot in the morning into a turkey you shot yesterday inside a small, what do they call a shoat, a small pig, and then you throw it in there with the Twinkies and, and uh, fire it up for a, a good Thanksgiving. Isn't that the way what it is? What is that in called? Iowa? It's not turducken because if, if you well, this has got a, a pig this is too. way past. Yeah, this we've gone way past turducken. <laughs> is that what you? What are you gonna have? Well, I have been invited over to my cousin's in-laws' house for their Thanksgiving dinner. So they have they're tra they have traditional food uh, turkey stuffing mashed potatoes rolls, and my cousin's mother in law Rita makes the best pumpkin bars I've ever tasted. So pumpkin definitely bar. have those. And then Rocky and I Thanksgiving night, my dog, we will each have a sirloin steak. You mean you're gonna have a sirloin steak after your turkey dinner? Well, you have. I have to have a lunch and a dinner. <laughs> well, that's what the turkey's for. You know, you take some home. You know, you're Eat already passed leftovers. out with your uh, belt off, and then you have some more, and you pass out again. And there then was it's, no cranberry then it's sauce. Friday. Well, the Patriots play Thanksgiving no night. Sauce. Are they gonna beat so, the Jets? Oh, that's a different show. So I have to be awake for the Patriots game Thursday night. Well, when are you having your Thanksgiving repast on Thanksgiving? Or is it one of those Iowa things, you know? Uh... No, we'll, we'll have it on Thanksgiving, and I'll take a nap before the Patriots game at 7. Before you have the sirloin steak? Yeah. Are you going to cook it out of doors on, uh, on the pickup truck, uh, on, like, the Weber grill out in the pickup truck, to, like, you know, yeah. like you're at the stadium? Uh, no, I will Shucks. grill the steaks on my George Foreman grill. So all this hostility about Iowa, Eric, is based on the fact that uh, I guess that the Democratic Party wants to take both the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary away. But we've been through that here in New Hampshire every, every year I can remember back to like 76, you know, 80. They always wanted to get, get rid of it. Yeah, when Hugh Gallon was governor, they were, <laughs> they were trying to take it away. The late Hugh Gallon. It's the only de first Democrat. Why are they trying to take the primary away? I thought everybody had a primary. Well, no, they people want would rather, a lot of states would want to be the first to primary. Be the pri and we're the first primary. Right, we really screwed up last time, you know. Usually, uh, up until Bill Clinton in 92, from 52 through 88, Anybody that won president won the New Hampshire primary. Oh. Yes. And the New Hampshire primary in 52 sank Truman because SD's keep offer came in. Because Truman would have been able to run for his own second term, although his, his popularity was about Nixon's at that time. But, you know, and he'd already done almost eight years because FDR croaked after a month in office. But, uh, then we did in Lyndon Johnson in 68. See, you're, 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 you know, I don't, I'm not holding against you for not being a native Granite Stater. Thank you. In fact, there's some positive things about you not being from the Granite State. Like you have a multi-syllabic vocabulary. <laughs> hey, how did you develop your multi-syllabic uh, uh, vocabulary in Iowa? Is it from going to the movies, uh, Eric? I would say movies, uh, watch, uh, really just kind of expanding myself outside of traditional forms of media as well in iowa either people watch uh cnn or fox news and i would always look at, for different ways to get my news even growing up do they have uh chapter books out in iowa yeah we got those a few years back john a along with the guppies reader right yeah, oh, well, we had to get rid of the Guppies Reader. Too many people were taking too long with them from our libraries. Ooh. 
Well, this is just uh, like, you know, I just think of Iowa in the way I think of the New York Yankees, you know? What would you say to that, uh, Eric? Do I, I, th I think you have already, uh, you have your own opinions of the state of Iowa. Well, it, uh, I, like I said, one of my favorite movies, Some Came Running, Vincent Minnelli, 1958, was actually shot in Iowa. Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Shirley MacLaine. Ooh. Yeah. That's quite a cast. And Arthur Kennedy was nominated five times for a supporting uh, Oscar. No, Maybe once as a best notes. actor and four times. But he never quite made it. Mm. One of the ironies was his real name was John Kennedy. But this was he before JFK. Oh. No, he's from... He played... Uh, Biff on Broadway in Death of a Salesman. But we were going to mm. talk about movies, weren't we, Ma Miriam? Mm -hmm. Ma I'm going to go with a little thing with Miriam. Can you play the clip, Dragnet? Woman Miller brought the female suspect, Camille Gerhardt, from her jail cell to Chief Snotty's office. He got a lot of nerve waking me up in the middle of the night like this. These are Los Angeles police officers. They want to ask you a few questions. It's our duty to inform you that you have the right to answer or not answer. Get me a lawyer. I know. I know the whole scam. You got a cigarette? You old enough to smoke? I'm old enough to do anything, including clam up. I know my rights, Fuzz, and I got a right to not even talk to you. You're wasting your time in my beauty sleep because I ain't telling you nothing. Not a thing about nothing. Now, how about that cigarette? Let me get back to that flea bag they call a cell. You got nice eyes for a cop. Bet your mother had a loud bark. Mary, I, I knew you were a winner as a guest when you said that uh, you watched Dragnet uh, on Wii TV. I guess I don't know. My Channel twenty or yeah. whatever it is on yeah. the cable. I don't know. I don't know. What make what gave you a Dragnet fetish? <laughs> <laughs> that was I what my love, husband wanted it. to watch. I love it. I do. I don't know. It's it can be very very funny. It gets it's so, so it's, it's campy. campy. <laughs> it really is campy. Um, oh, there was that it's, one episode with the woman. She's blind, and somebody <laughs> robbed her, and she just keeps saying, "I have a stick," and it just that that one just made me laugh so much. I don't know. I like them all though. Well, if you watch the old Dragnets, which are in black and white, they're very gritty and they're really, you know, it ends with like, uh, one of the ones was, uh, oh, Moss disappeared. We haven't heard from her for three months. And they go over and the guy's, for some reason, a German. That's part of the thing. Right. And after a while, it turns out that he killed her, cut her up in the bathtub, and then burned her. Because every place in California, Los Angeles, had, you know, had one of those brick grills. Right. And, and then it ends. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber, and it's like, oh. holy smoke. And you I need watch to go back and watch the old one. And you watch the 60s one. Basically, Jack Webb came back. It was like he wanted to have this anti-drug message. So the first episode is the famous Blue Boy, where the guy goes crazy on LSD and dies. Oh. You okay. must have seen that I'm one. sure I have. Oh, I love Blue Boy. Blue Boy. <laughs> that's so that's, that's so not fun. the same as the one where the kid... What? Where the parents are are like all drugged up and the kid dies in the bathroom. That's one of the best ones where you remember the father turns them in because they're smoking marijuana. They're smoking marijuana cigarettes and they got a two and a half year old daughter. And they all they go over and there's that kid who's in he's in like of uh, the ninety episodes. It's like Jill Ban that was Jill Banner, Marlon Brando's old girlfriend. And uh, she's in like ten episodes. Everybody's like recycled. And all you have to do is watch like a month, like four, uh, uh, what, which would be like four episodes, and they're all back, you know? Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, when they finally get the warrant to go in, you know, for the child uh, protection, and I think that, that, that uh, pretty in the 60s way with the hair and everything, 
a policewoman that Joe never dates. I think they were going to go over to the Bill Gann, you know, uh, the, the Gannons once, but never made it. Because I think that Joe had to shoot somebody or somebody at the laundromat. Oh, right, but, right. I remember that one. But they go and then, oh my God, where, where's little Sally? And then they run in the bathtub and she's, she's drowned. drowned. The funny thing is, uh, ironically, like a couple months ago, that actually happened. Oh, yeah. Somewhere in America, you know, the tot drowned because the... Oh. Uh, because the, the parents are a mess. Yeah, but not on marijuana. They were like on crack. Not crack. What's it? Meth, though? Crystal meth. Yeah, probably. So are you a Dragnet fan, uh, Eric? Absolutely. I love Dragnet. Um, for me, it's the hard-boiled dialogue that Joe Friday has. <laughs> it's very... In, you know, John, I love film noir. Um, it's very noirish. So, I, of course, I love it. The thing is, though, is Joe Friday looks like he's got a stick up his ass all the time. You know how he walks like that? Dun, dun, dun. And in the 50s, he's thin and he's wiry, so he looks like... But now he's kind of fat because between the two series, he was the head of like one of the stu Universal Studios for a bit, and they kicked him out. He made a bunch of movies, and he was always associated with jazz, you know? In the 50s and that. He actually, we, if we only had it, uh, he did a cover of... Uh, that great so trial in the a little tenderness. Huh. If you're Did, if your woman's weary, try a little tenderness. You know, <laughs> in that inimitable voice. But right. It's like he's just talking his way through it, and it was on Golden Throats, the first volume. Oh I wish gosh. we had it right now. That's folks. hysterical. But yeah, uh, it's so campy. It's 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 just beyond belief. And they always do things to have Bill aggravating him. Right. You need to eat this. You need to eat that. You right. Need to, you, you should have a, you should settle down. Have you ever done this? He's always sort of criticizing Joe's life, and Joe is just not into it. Right. Uh, needling him. He started out his career and uh, Henry Mor Harry Morgan. He actually started out his career as Henry Morgan because it was a Harry Morgan on the radio. And he was a bad guy in Westerns. And he used to be with Jack Elam. Remember him with the, the funny the eyes oh, going yeah. into and one they would be <laughs> occasionally they'd be partnered up. They must have been at the same studio. And uh, then he had a comedy show that I don't remember called Phyllis and Somebody. My sister told me about it. And then he went into this. But of course, most people are going to remember him for being Mash for Colonel uh, Henry Potter, which was. It's such a completely different character. But he's played all sorts of characters through his career. He was one of those character actors that was always in demand. But uh, I couldn't stand MASH after a few years because I, I, I am a, 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 I consider myself like a Mike Dukakis, John Kerry liberal folks, but I can't stand earnest liberalism. It must be, you know, uh, some type of a Catholic overhang of you know, self-criticism or self-hatred, even though I'm not a Catholic. Mm. I'm an environmental Catholic. If I think, if you think about something, you've done it. Oh no. Oh yeah, I actually, uh, I've actually Dude. thought about watching Friends once, and so now I'm tainted forever. Forever. <laughs> There's a saying. Did I watch a full episode? I don't think I ever watched. Oh, a full I only episode watched of... about the first few minutes of a Friends episode. The beginning. It was. I was a Seinfeld fan. They say you're either one or the other. Oh, okay. I didn't watch either. <laughs> I didn't really watch either one that much. I watched Friends. For one episode that has Penn from Penn and Teller in it, because oh. I'm a big Penn and Teller fan, and see all these riches we found out about Marion. <laughs> Did you see Penn and Teller get killed? Oh gosh, yes. You oh know who my gosh. Directed that. Hmm. Arthur Penn directed that. Yeah, it's the last film he ever directed. Yeah, I have that. Is I have that any, on uh, DVD at home. I have their series. I like it. I don't. I mean. Yeah, Not everybody's gonna balls. like it. It's, yeah, but it was. It's funny. Everybody dies at the end. All right, you you, uh, uh, I have all <laughs> their series with, called. We can't say what the title is. Bowl. Oh yeah, yeah. Bowl. They um they've done a couple of other specials. They did one that was called You Can't Do This at Home and um. Oh, I well, I like, uh, you know, I'm not saying that we're aligned politically, but I like Penn Gillette and that the. the uh, Skepticism, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I do too. I'm not. A lot of. I'm not. Are, a, yeah. He's a libertarian. I'm not a libertarian. Right. I'm not a libertarian. Um, he's but even the skepticism gone back a I like. But the skepticism, uh, yeah, yeah about like stuff. So, Eric, uh, what are we going to talk about next? We've talked about. Uh, well, we didn't talk. Uh, the that first clip was from Woody Allen's Bananas. Miriam, when did you first see a Woody Allen film? I was thirteen. You shouldn't cross your arms because that is telling the audience that okay. you're cutting them off. You should be open. Okay. Flow. That's why I always use my hands. You know, you can do like an interpretive thing. There you I go. never know what to do with my hands, so that's why. Most I'll actors just do don't. an interpretive dance the whole time. It'll be very distracting. Right. But <laughs> actors, it's that's, you see some actors don't know how to hold their hands. But, yeah, uh, I don't. Well, and I, be, I, I have to sort of keep myself, too, from tapping the table and stuff because I get... Okay. When was your? I asked you, would you be offended if we had a Woody Allen clip? Because no. he, he's been lynched and so uh Oh, what no. was that? The, uh, uh, it, it sounded like a, a emptying drain pipe there in Iowa. Are you having another hurricane? Or is, they have tornadoes, right? They do have tornadoes. We have tornadoes, but it's past tornado season. I don't know what that is. I do live in an apartment, so it could have been my neighbor above me. Well, that's true, you know, it's true. But you were going to tell us when you saw your first Woody Allen film. I was 13, so 1975. And it was a double feature with Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And yeah, we had that. I came the away from that uh, feeling like, what did I just watch? Um, it was Woody Allen's Take the Money and Run. That was, yeah, Take the Money and Run. Yeah, it got released. Uh, I, I remember I was... Uh, I'd been a sophomore in high school, 75, or going to junior year. That was a big, big film with us, Monty Python. I, mean, I was in middle school. But they ha tried to release the Monty Python show on pay t you know, a commercial TV, and it just, it just flopped. Didn't, yeah. But then they put it on PBS, and it was a big, well, big hit for PBS. And I, I was just fascinated by that. I but watched the movie it was endlessly, yes. I but my first Woody Allen movie I saw was Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex, But Were Afraid, Afraid to, to ask, ask, which came out in 72. And my father uh, came visiting, and he took me to it. My brother didn't want to see it. And it was R-rated, and we went in. And I remember watching it, and my father, big Woody Allen fan, he's laughing. And I got a lot of the jokes because my, bro my father, as part of our sex education, gave us a year's worth of Playboys, my brother and I. I think from 72 to early 73 or whatever. And uh, things I thought I knew about, later on I realized I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the education it's like the one, got. what is sodomy? <laughs> you have Gene Wilder and the sheep. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's, so, you know, it's 1972, late 72. I like the, I like I the one know. with the giant breasts. And and these, <laughs> things <come laughs> in, these things come, these things <laughs> always come in pairs. <laughs> We can't talk about that, <laughs> right? And uh, then there was so <laughs> what? 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 It's a transvestite with Lou jo Jacoby of all people. Remember? Oh, why don't I remember? He was that uh, Jewish American character uh -huh. actor right. that always looked. I think he. Uh, I think he's in uh, the Diary of Anne Frank. Oh, I but he's in all sorts of things. He was right. very popular. <laughs> they go over to see the. They're their prospective in-laws, and he says, "I have to go to the bathroom." And then he sneaks up to there, the uh, and he gets into the he gets into the <laughs> closet. He goes into their bedroom, and he starts putting on, on her the wife's cook. And they and he was such a homely-looking guy. <laughs> and then remember, he falls out the window. Oh right. Oh yeah, folks. Yeah, you know, uh, you just have to laugh along with us. But I remember years later, I'm at BU, and I took my girlfriend to see the. She had just come from Israel. She was a conscientious objector. So to stay out of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, she came to. And she didn't. She was a very ardent feminist at the time. She didn't quite know what to think about that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, but my father always took us to R-rated movies, you know. Yeah, dirty Harry movies. Yeah. There wasn't, you know, there, that was pretty uh, straightforward. Mostly violence. Yeah. Well, they were funny, film. though. Dirty Harry? There were funny moments in it. The first Dirty Harry film is a classic, but that's uh, because it's uh, directed by Don Siegel. Mm. 
And you know the irony, uh, Eric, was Don Siegel was always considered a liberal filmmaker. He had made uh, the original uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But everybody was, you know, Pauline Kael, the famous critic, said, oh, this is a fascist film. Uh, he also directed The Killers. Right, which was a TV movie, but it was too violent. That was Ronald Reagan's last role as an actor. It was con I, too violent, so they released it in the theater. What? I love his version of The Killers. I think it's brilliant. Well, nobody's actually made a, uh, a movie of the actual killers, the short story by Hemingway. They just take the title <laughs> and, they, and just that just one make whatever they around. want. Right. Oh, but the original killers that introduced Burt Lancaster in 46 is a masterpiece. And was that wasn't her first movie. Ava Gardner, when she was young, what a beauty. But she got done in by alcoholism. The, the 1946 version is really good as well. I just like the Don Siegel version. Yeah. And, uh, but in the 46 version, you have William Conrad as one of the killers, who was Cannon. Cannon. So, oh, I see. I, we were, you know what? I was sitting in the uh, kitchen, and my sister was watching TV. It was like, and I heard, and I'm listening, and it says, I bet she's watching Quincy. <laughs> and sure enough, he was. And I didn't even hear Jack Klugman. It's you just, just the way like, you're, you just, you know, you're so used to the these shows that you grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We watched every one of those, I'm sure. Well, it's been a long time, so I don't even remember. See, I remember one. There's one episode I remember where somebody got bubonic plague. That's the only one I remember. Somebody's out in the desert and they got bubonic plague. <laughs> One of the good things about old TV is when I was a kid, I'd see all the familiar actors, and I, it used to really irritate me. But now I'm an old fart. I see them, and I actually know who they are, and it's, like, comforting. Yeah, I get it. I get that. It's like, oh, my oh, God, the that physician that, that killed the baby with the forceps and Quincy's racing against time to get a restraining order, that's John Denner. <laughs> well, if you know who John Denner is. I know. He, he was in, if you saw him, you'd know him. But uh, we only have a half hour. You know, I, I brought in the Woody Allen about satire. Uh, satire uh, is something that uh, closes and debuke on a Thursday. You know, plays open on a Thursday. And so a, a satire will close. The fa uh, famous George S. Kaufman won a couple Pulitzer Prizes, said that. Do you want to talk? Uh, you did a excellent review of Stanley Kubrick's film. Do you want to talk like uh, some for talk about the movie year that you reviewed? Um, Doctor Strange Love or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Uh, excellent piece of satire. I would probably have to agree with Roger Ebert. I have two clips. And. It, when he said that he thinks it's the best piece of political satire ever done on film, I certainly think it is. I'd agree. Hey, can we show the first clip of Dr. Strangelove? Which we'll later have to cut out for the YouTube video. Everybody should be watching. Uh, friends, I'm Oscar for Key and the recall code. Have you got them handed, sir? I told you to take it easy, group captain. There's nothing anybody can do about this thing now. I'm the only person who knows the three-letter code group. Then I must insist, sir, that you give them to him. Do I take it, sir, that you are threatening a bother officer with a gun? Mandrake, I suppose it never occurred to you that while we're chatting here so enjoyably, a decision is being made by the president and the joint chiefs in the war room at the Pentagon. And when they realize there was no possibility of recalling the wing, there will be only one course of action open. Total commitment. Mandrake, do you recall what Clemenceau once said about war? Uh, no, I didn't think I do, sir, no. He said war was too important to be left to the generals. When he said that, 50 years ago, he might have been right. But today, war is too important to be left to politicians. They have neither the time 
the training, nor the inclination for strategic thought. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. Eric, I grew up, I was born in 19, late 59, and I was pretty conscious since, remember, I think since my fourth birthday uh, in late 1963. My sister says, anybody can find I your birthday Eric froze. online. Oh, what? Eric is frozen. Eric, froze. Eric, you froze. What, what do we do? I X him out? Um, let me take care of it. Don't touch it. Okay. Keep, keep talking. And uh, well, I wanted to say, Eric, there were actually people talking about that stuff, how uh, fluoride was going to destroy America, like the John Birches and that. It's not so much that it was going to poison you. It was just a over, the government was overreaching to Florida, go into your water. In Florida. Now, now, now that I'm older, I think they have a point. But when I was young, you know, it was true. Uh-oh. It sounds like, do you ever see the movie uh, Voyage to the B uh, Bottom of the Sea? And the That's TV exactly series? what it sounds like. Do, do. Admiral Nelson. Uh, I, I, guess, uh, I guess in Iowa, the telecommunications failed, folks. That tornado must have been uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it already reduced the Iowa City into uh, the, the shanty town in the back. <laughs> Unlike our beauty. Isn't that a beautiful photo? It is. It makes New Hampshire, uh, Man New Hampshire, makes Manchester, well, to me, Manchester is New Hampshire. Uh, and Bedford is, you know, po to me, because my Aunt Kay lived in Bedford. You know, they're like s an appendage. It's like the appendix. Uh, or if you wanted to use Bedford, we could use, like, this is the broad bottom of, uh, of Bedford, you know, which probably is more true. But uh, I guess this show is going a little awry, but that's part of the fun. I only <laughs> wish Norm the Psychic was still here. To <laughs> barge he in. could have told us that this was going to happen with the. Were you with ever here when Norm barged no, in? No. I don't know. I didn't know Norm. You didn't know Norm's the Psychic? No. General Baldwin well, was did, on the show three times. When did he pass times. away? How long is it? Earlier been? this year. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a sad um, thing. I actually cried a bit, uh, yeah. at, you know, being such a, uh, such machismo, I can say yeah. these things. You know, I had tears in my eyes when I heard the, the norm. Even now. Oh. Although I'm having trouble with this eye. Oh, no. Yeah. So I, I, I can't get Manchester television, so. So it I is have your. I watch things on YouTube. That's right. Yeah, I, I was remiss in putting the show out there because I couldn't find it on my hard drive. Oh. For some reason, uh, I'd already edited it, and I didn't realize that, so I edited it again, and the original file disappeared. Oh, no. So what do you think of uh, Dr. Strangelove, since Eric it's has abandoned us? It's incredibly funny, um, and it makes a lot of good points. It's scary because it really should be. If people aren't, af aren't frightened by it, they should be. <laughs> Because it just seems, I mean, it, it, it just seems like it's so true. At the time it came out, it was denounced by many critics, including Bosley Crothers of the New York uh, Times, who had become an old fart. He'd been there since the 40s. And after he canned the Bonnie and Clyde and all the films in 67, they finally got rid of him. But he said, you know, that these people thought it was an immoral film because we needed a nuclear deterrent to stop the Soviet Union and communism from taking over everything. So that this would make fun of the idea of the nuclear deterrent was un-American. And it, I don't think it does make fun of it and necessarily. Dangerous. But I, I mean, well, it, 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 <laughs> I mean, it, shows, it does, you know. It shows the absurdity of it. Well, at the same time, Failsafe came out. And uh, Failsafe is the same story where uh, it's about a nuclear attack on the Soviet Union from the Americans that can't be deterred because something goes wrong. Right. So it's be basically the same story, but without the humor. Right. And Kubrick actually sued the, the fail-safe people because 
the original novel is called Code Red, and it's serious, just like Failsafe. I'm sure a lot of people, those are the two films you watch. And even though Sidney Lumet is a great director too, not in the class of Kubrick, who's an auteur and one of the great ones, right. he, uh, it's just not as good a film, but it's straight. It's got Henry Fonda as the president. I mean, how much better can you get than that as a presidential casting? True. But he was going to make this as a straight film. Then he realized how absurd it was. Daniel Ellsberg was at Harvard with Henry Kissinger. And people used to think that Henry Kissinger influenced Strange Love, but that's not true. But uh, they both were, were at Harvard researching nuclear war strategies, how nuclear war could be an effective, because it's supposed to be a deterrent. You're not supposed to go to nuclear war, but there's different strategies to use it so you can threaten nuclear war, you can bluff nuclear war. Uh, one, in 1973, Nixon took uh, the military up to the defense posture just before all-out nuclear war over the, the rumors that the Soviet Union was going to put an airborne division into the Sinai to stop the Israel in the 73 war. And, uh, yeah, that was serious. And uh, he also now that it's declassified, during the, uh, when Bangladesh, which was East Pakistan, broke away from India, and they had that horrible massacre, you know, the Pakistanis from West Pakistan, which is a great ally in the United States, because we didn't like India because they were not aligned and they were too friendly to Russia. They were massacring, they were murdering all the intellectuals, same thing that happened years later in Biafra. Well, they were actually happened at the same time. Uh, Nixon took us up to that defense posture again, even though the Soviet Union really nothing to, he had no real interest in it. But uh, Nixon, I guess, told uh, one of his advi Kissinger that you know he wanted the Ch uh, Russians to think that he was insane, that he might actually push the button. Yeah. And so that is why Dr. Strangelove is uh, relevant. Well, it's relevant because nobody's talking about nuclear war. We're closer to nuclear war than any time since the year you were born. Yeah. I don't remember the uh, missiles of October, Cuba. Yeah, I don't remember that. But, I, think I, that's, I think that's before me. But, you know, when I uh, was studying all this back in the 80s, you would never have thought of having anything to do with Ukraine because Ukraine was such an essential part of the Soviet Union and been part of the Russian Empire for over 500 years, you know. But the idea of screwing with uh, having anything to do with Ukraine, that would be grounds for a nuclear war. But, uh, so that's something to think. But people don't want to talk about that. No. Nope. Because, uh, Matt Con like Matt Conan says, it's not going to happen. I hope he's right. <laughs> Well, it's been a long time. Back in 19... This movie was made in 1963. It was only 18 years uh, Hiroshima was bombed. But nobody's used nuclear weapons since. That's good. Yeah, but see, uh, we're not being uh, in the movies anymore. The, it's as Harry Truman said, he didn't use them in, in uh, Korea because he wanted to stop the war. But... <laughs> okay, we'll go back if we ever get Eric back. But uh, uh, Harry Truman said, you know, Japan was on the ropes, but they were fighting to the death. So you drop the bombs. They drop one bomb, they're still uh, not surrendering. Then they drop another bomb, then they take another five days to surrender. Oh but he uh, said it wouldn't have happened in Korea. But you see, then there's tactical nukes. How do you, you know? There's, there's volumes and volumes and volumes of research. And Henry Kissinger and Daniel Ellsberg, who's famous for the Pentagon Papers, because he worked for the Rand Corporation afterwards. If you're of a certain generation, the Rand Corporation was like this, like the SS, you know, during the Vietnam War. You know, because they did all the, res the research into the war. As Daniel Ellsberg uh, said, 1967, the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, after going uh, in Saigon, told him the war was lost already. But they were still saying to the press that the war was won. So that's when the Viet Cong 
launched the Tet Offensive in the end of January of, of, 19, uh, of 1968, when they were telling the war was won, well, they know it's lost. The Viet Cong got right into br breach the U.S. Embassy. I mean, it was a it was a strategic and tactical defeat for them, but psychologically, it was a blow to uh, the United States because you have Walter Cronkite, who was the number one newsman, saying that he'd been you know we'd been lied to, that they had been lying to us all along. I was reading. Uh, no, this is what Matt says: never taking a breath. You know, if you uh, want to say something, just tell me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening. I'm trying to learn because I don't know all of these things. But General Wesley Clark was reading his book. He was the uh, Supreme Allied Commander. We were in the Ser Serbia, Kosovo, and that, which I had family members in that. Said, "You can, uh, you have to, pr always have to project that you're winning, or you will lose the public and political backing for the war you have to do." So, so there really wasn't much choice for them to... Well, you notice in Ukraine, every week, uh, the Ukrainians are winning, and, and Russia's close to collapsing. Then then Russia's not, and they need more money. And then it's a, it just, it's like if you read 1984, you know, they're always at war with uh, uh, West Asia, or, 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 Euro uh, or, or and Eurasia. But, you know, they flip around. And they're always ready to be defeated. And then suddenly they have this massive victory. And But, you know, Orwell's was just talking about what's propaganda. Propaganda is a word that got a very negative connotation after World War II because of Hitler and Goebbels. Right. Propaganda is just, you know, a type of communications, you know. Hey, hooray for our side. Vote for, vote for me. That's propaganda. It's all propaganda, yeah. But the first casualty of any war is the truth. That's a maxim. So everybody wonders why I'm so cynical about Ukraine. Hey, I remember uh, the wonderful South Vietnamese. Uh, those, th you know. Hey, uh, he's back. You're back. Well, I guess hey. we're back to Ward 13 goes to the movies. I just uh, took a little di uh, digression into history. Let's watch. We could have watched the second clip. Let's watch the second clip of of. Uh, Man, Drake. Yes, Dad? Have you ever seen a commie drink a glass of water? Well, yeah, I, I can't say I have, Jack. <laughs> Vodka. That's what they drink, isn't it? Never water? Well, I, I believe that's what they drink, Jack, yes. On no account will a commie ever drink water, and not without good reason. Oh. Yes, I um, can't quite see what you're getting at, Jack. Water. That's what I'm getting at, water. Mandrake, water is the source of all life. Seven-tenths of this Earth's surface is water. Why do you realize that 70% of you is water? Oh, Lord. And as human beings, you and I need fresh, pure water to replenish our precious bodily fluids. Yes. Are you beginning to understand? Yes. <laughs> Mandrake. <laughs> Mandrake, have you never wondered why I drink only distilled water or rainwater and only pure grain alcohol? Well, it, it, it did occur to me, Jack, yes. Have you ever heard of a thing called fluoridation? Fluoridation of water? Uh, yes, I, I have heard of that, Jack, yes. Yes. Well, do you know what it is? No. No, I don't know what it is now. Do you realize that fluoridation is the most monstrously conceived and dangerous communist plot we have ever had to face? <laughs> talking to Eric uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick and I was saying to Miriam they ha it was a it was called Code Red and it was a serious thing like Failsafe and the people he later and Kubrick they sued the people that wrote Failsafe in the movie 
be for uh, plagiarism. And it was straight, but when, as I was talking to you, there's all these strategies about how to, like, if not win a nuclear war, use nuclear arms. Like, you know, they talk about Putin can use tactical nukes and all that. And they actually, like I said, there's just reams of stuff about this. And I guess Kubrick, didn't he read like something like a god awful amount of books on nuclear uh, gamesmanship? Yes, he did. He, uh, he really wanted to focus on... Napoleon's in Italy? There's like 200 books. Oh. Um. <laughs> oh, uh, I thought we were, uh, I thought Mike was uh, off. <laughs> this is a successful. We're going to edit this one down to about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the the joys of community television. Are you through with what you were going to say? Um, I was just going to add that Kubrick really wanted to make the nuclear part of this film as accurate as he could. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, he, after reading about nuclear gamesmanship, because there's the Ellsberg paradox, it has to do with marbles, you know, these, and Kissinger was part of that too, of uh, how to use nuclear weapons as a diplomatic tool and how to adapt your diplomacy to nuclear war. He said, this is just utterly absurd. And then he based George C. Scott's character that's uh, 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 that's General Turgidson, right? Oh, he's great. All the Tur names are Turgid, you know, right. which Turgidson. kind of sexual. And then, uh, of course, the president, Peter Sellers plays three roles. Muffly Merkin. Muffly. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know, a Merkin. Doesn't sound very powerful. Well, as the Merkin president. is actually a uh, piece of, of uh, like a toupee. For the pubic region, be it <laughs> oh, you lost yes. your pubic hair to yeah. like scarlet fever or something, or you know during the Burt Reynolds period, you get American and, and put it on your chest. But, Somebody uh, just posted a thing on Facebook about Merkins. It was an was ad. Was that me? Was that you? Yeah, I that don't was know. Me. Somebody did. Well, we <laughs> so always. I knew what it was. You know, or a Matt, yeah. Matt Connaughton is very her suit, which means hairy, and you know he had a going business uh, with the. You know, selling Merkins made from his own bodily hair. That's when you're a Yeti, you can get away with these things, you know. Sas just don't call him a Sasquatch. Eric, uh, any more remarks about uh, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove? And you could tell the audience where they could find uh, your review. All right. Um, interesting enough, Peter Sellers was actually supposed to play the Slim Pickens role as well. He was supposed to do four roles in the movie. Yes, uh, we oh, already that? talked about that off camera. <laughs> we oh, might have talked Slim about it on camera. I think we talked think about we it on camera, camera on while camera. the tornado took you Slim, away, Dorothy. Slim, Slim Pickens was great, though. I'm glad yeah. that he was in that. Well, James Earl Jones and George C. Scott were hired because George C. Scott was playing The Merchant of Venice, and he saw James Earl Jones, who later became a great actor himself, an honorary Oscar winner. And... Uh, and James Earl Jones came from a theatrical family, African American. You know, his father was an actor who appears famously in uh, *The Sting*, who's Robert Redford's mentor in the movie. And when he was met Slim Pickens, he thought this was his a character. And he asked somebody, "When does he break character?" He says, "No, that that that's him. That's just him." Yeah. You know, there's a room. that character in every movie he oh, was yeah. in. You know, he yeah. was in Blazing Saddles, and it was exactly the same thing. Oh, yeah, but he, he was completely reliable for that. <laughs> He's great in Blazing Saddles. <laughs> but he had been in Marlon Brando's movie, uh, only directorial movie, uh, One-Eyed Jacks. So everybody, to, you know, the generation of actors after Brando, you know, Brand Brando is like God to them. So he asked Slim Pickens... Uh, what was Marlon Brando like? And he said, well, I'll tell you. Buddy wa is, is white to me. And, and then, <laughs> what did he say? That he's white to you? But that's a, a deep southernism, you know? He's white to me. He's, uh, you know, he's good. He's good. Being a white man, you know? Right. 
<laughs> and he Woo! says, he just, this is a guy, He's a, he was a Texas rodeo cowboy. He and Ben Johnson, who won an Oscar uh, uh, for uh, The Last Picture Show, they were so good with horses, they're invaluable, that, you know, Slim Pickens, when, he's, uh, when you watch him, his first scene, when he comes into the scene in Blazing Cells, he can stop that horse on a dime into a tight shot so you don't blow the shot, you know? And they were great horsemen that then they realized, oh, these guys are, you know, like natural characters. Because Sam Peckinpah used Slim Pickens a lot, didn't he, uh, Eric? Yes, he did. Um, Sam Peckinpah used him very frequently. I'm trying to think how many movies he was in. Oh, him and L.Q. Jones. Uh, he's in uh, most of the westerns. I, I just think we should do a review. One of my favorite uh, movies is uh, Pat Garrett and B Billy the Kid. When uh, One of my favorite westerns, as well as Peck and Paw films, I don't know if you'd call it a western per se. I do, certainly, is Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Oh, that's one of my, fa my brother's favorite movies. He says, how can you not love a movie where a guy is t uh, talking to a severed head uh, in the passenger side uh, seat of his car. <laughs> and, and really. Okay, I need to see this one. And uh, oh, I haven't seen it. Brilliant. I haven't what did you it. say? It's brilliant. It, it's such an amazing film, and it encompasses so many different genres. I've never watched a few before. Though. And Warren Oates is great. You know what? Warren Oates is imitating Sam Peckinpah, they say. I did not know that. Yeah. And that's another character actor that uh, he loved that was, uh, although he's not in that many movies, was Gig Young, who was Elizabeth Montgomery's first husband, a terrible alcoholic who later killed himself and his wife, you know? Oh, my. But Gig Young was supposed to be, had the role in Blazing Saddles, played by, uh, of the kid, played by uh, Gene Wilder. But he had the DTs the first day on the set, Ugh. so they had the farm. And then Gene Wilder says, "What about me?" <laughs> and memorably cast in there. But uh, somebody like a Slim Pickens and Ben Johnson, they were just like cowboys. But then like John Ford liked Ben Johnson, and eventually somebody. Then you got uh, Peter, the late Peter Bogdanovich, put him in a role, and he won an Oscar. But uh, we're running out of time, Eric. We're not going to get to uh, talk about Casino any. Miriam, uh, why don't you tell us uh, what's going on in Miriam's world? Um, working, mostly. Um, I don't know. What is You're working tell? for that satanic uh, school system that's promoting uh, uh, the castration of young children. Uh, uh, no, thank you. Um, oh, uh, I'm working for a school, <laughs> yes. I work with kids who need extra support that's pretty much what I do is that a fulfilling uh, job it is I love it whenever a kid makes any kind of progress at all I think it's really exciting and I don't know they seem to need some things that I just really know how to do I mean like there's computer stuff that I'm having to do normally it's done maybe by a speech language pathologist, but I figured out how to program a thing. And I mean, it's, it's just, it's all kinds of stuff. So these are children with disabilities. Yes. And then they get, uh, there's, uh, they're written, uh, you know, I'm saying written up, that's an army term, but you develop a plan of how to help them with the disabilities right. so they can, co they cope with the disability and they, they, learn, they can learn. Right, right, IEP. Um, and, it's a, oh, right, right individualized education program. That would be something interesting to talk about yeah. in the future. Yeah, that's true. I've been on both sides of the table with that. I've worked with kids who have IEPs. My son had an IEP. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of, I'm not great with them, but I, I kind of have a sense of Well, it's very frustrating to a lot of parents that really don't know about it. Uh, and there a lot, many are, are just fi when you find out your ch child does have a disability, because there's so many types of disability. Like, you know, I found out, they didn't find out until I was at Defense Language Institute, I was dyslexic. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, yeah. Trying to figure out what to do. Once you figure out what the disability is, right. and sometimes 
you know, they're not sure what it is, and maybe it's more than one thing. Is there to since we're still Ward Thirteen goes to movies? Uh, are any, do any of your kids use movie therapy? No. I can actually. There was movie. I. Uh, PhD psychologist that came up with movie therapy and I actually have a book by him that has nothing to do with the movie therapy but I think he was the only movie therapist. Hmm. Eric, uh, have you used the movies as therapy? I've never heard of it. It's never been prescribed <laughs> but I do uh, quite a bit. Um, as someone who does suffer from depression and anxiety if I just to get away. Oh, well, dear, well, uh, uh, Eric, it was nice to have you on. We're back. Oh, you're back. We're back. Now we have to go back to war. We're we're sh we're shifting between Ward Thirteen and the normal Ward Thirteen. I think we're, I'm going to call the show Justing Pilot the next time you come. Say that again. Justing Pilot. Justing Pilot. Oh yes, that's a book by Aldous Huxley, by the way. Oh, okay. What uh, what is truth? A jesting pilot asked, but didn't stay for the answer. That's from On Truth by Francis Bacon. Hmm. We got into a lot of trouble in Elizabeth the First Court. Yeah, the first Elizabeth the First. I mean. Right. Yeah. Any for, uh, last words, Eric, before you get sucked into a water spout? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, everyone, for the tech difficulties today. <laughs> well, that's why they created uh, the editing suite on Apple. And it's free, too. Yeah. Well, don't burn your, don't scald yourself when you're putting that, uh, was it the pork to ducklet? Into the 55-gallon uh, yeah. drum. Pig duckin'. I'll try it's that, a pig John. You can, uh, you'll see Ma Mary and I are going on the uh, Matt Connaughton show where I, I vowed to take an oath of silence. And uh, I'm okay. taking Does bets on that. Does that mean I'm going to be forced to, t to speak? <laughs> Eric, we will be doing a show soon about uh, the uh, sports betting and the lobbyists that are pushing it at universities. And I'm sure they're pushing it in the state of Iowa right now. Like they did it in Kansas. It's a, a shocking For now, it's legal. It's legal now in Iowa? Yeah, it's been legal for the last year two years. Good God. Wow. We're still, I think we should go to I, Ward, thir just Ward 13. It goes, goes I wild. I take advantage every Saturday. You're, you are a better? Yes. Uh, would Christ put a bet? On the Patriots, you really got to think Not about that season. one. <laughs> well, Eric, it was wonderful to have you. We'll see you soon. Nice to see Bye, you. Bye, everyone. Bye, and have a happy uh, Thanksgiving. And folks, it's mu oh, what'd you say? Both of you as well. Oh, okay. I don't Thank celebrate. You. I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. My uh, forefathers came here, you know, we were Indian fighters and stuff. So I'm doing penance. Yeah. That and the fact nobody invited me uh, to uh, anything. I'd have to go to Vermont if I, uh, you know, um, the, she's a vegetarian. And, you know, they really haven't improved vegetarian uh, turkeys. <laughs> hey, folks, uh, we will see you next week. Uh, you know, God knows what we're going to talk about. Adios.